After sending shockwaves throughout the financial industry now, Bitcoin is poised to revolutionize digital privacy as well. Whether it's between everyday citizens, investors, or corporations, every financial transaction we make is recorded. The institutions that regulate currency have created a system in which governments, banks, accountants, and notaries track these transactions, robbing the public of any privacy or control. Now that's why Bitcoin was released in 2009, as a currency for anyone who wants to keep the government out of their wallets. The digital currency uses encryption to regulate the creation of coins and verify the transactions. Now it's totally decentralized, which means it's not controlled by a single authority like the Federal Reserve. And unlike greenbacks, the Fed can't just print more cryptocurrency to inflate our way out of trouble. Its value reflects pure supply and demand, not a value forced into the system by regulation or through government monopolies. Now, the key technology behind Bitcoin is the blockchain, and it's revolutionizing digital privacy while simultaneously keeping data of online transactions in the public's hand rather than a single entity's. Now, beyond Bitcoin, blockchain could be used in any industry, from finance to medicine, to secure transactions and data and track how that data is used. Like an open ledger, each block represents one or more transactions. Though most of us think about bitcoins in purely financial terms, a block in a blockchain can represent anything like files, photos, or property deeds. Each block is encrypted so that only the people or companies participating in the transaction have a key. But the data is shared among hundreds of thousands of computers that participate in Bitcoin mining. Publicly sharing this ledger creates a new form of accountability and trust. And because of the thousands of copies, hackers or other malicious actors can't alter data once it's added. Combined with strong encryption, this means third parties are no longer needed to verify transactions. Now, Jamison Lobb is a software developer at BitGo, a Bitcoin and blockchain security business, and an expert in computer security. He joined me on Behind the Headline to explain this more in plain English and how blockchain is revolutionizing data privacy and how we can take back our privacy in this growing national security state. Check it out. Thank you so much, Jameson, for joining me today. Can you briefly explain the blockchain in plain English and how this is revolutionizing uh, data, pri data privacy in our surveillance state? Sure. Uh, at a very high non-technical level, the fundamental question that blockchains answer is how do we keep track of ownership and property in a way that doesn't require trusted authorities? So if you think about how ownership of property is currently tracked, whether it's your house, your car, stocks, bonds, or money itself, these are currently all attested by trusted authorities, such as government agencies or financial entities that are regulated by governments. And these entities are already using modern technology to track the ownership digitally, but they're doing so with their own private databases. And essentially what blockchains do is they flip this model on its head. And we instead make the database or the, the, the ledger, if you will, public so that everyone who is using the system is checking each other's work. This makes the system what we call trustless because you're no longer relying upon anyone in the network to be honest to you. And it doesn't fundamentally protect us from uh, government or corporate spying, or um, there's still a lot of privacy issues, but what it really protects us against is, is corruption, like government and corporate corruption, because we're, we're able to be sure that no one is trying to defraud us. So if it doesn't protect us against surveillance, I mean, how can this protect citizens from government and corporate corruption, as you say? Uh, I mean, th there's a lot of different ways that you can consider there to be corruption in the system, uh, especially in the financial system. Um, both government and the, the banking system have ways of essentially creating money out of thin air. Uh, and this can be through uh, inflation. It can be through quantitative easing. Um, there's also, as we've seen like in 2008, um, through very complicated manipulation of financial markets through like algorithmic derivatives and other things that are so complicated that almost nobody understands them. And so we, you, you can actually run, you know, stock markets and financial networks on blockchains and then that enables everyone else to be sure that you're playing by the rules essentially. 
So in a blockchain, the transactions themselves are encrypted, but shared among dozens, if not hundreds of computers. I mean, can you explain how this actually makes users more secure um, and creates trust? Yeah, um, so we say that the, the transactions are cryptographically signed. The, the transaction data itself is not encrypted, which would make it uh, private and make it unable for other people to, to see the transaction. Uh, though there are new systems that are being developed where the transaction data is encrypted. Uh, there are a lot of interesting privacy innovations that are currently uh, being undertaken in this space. But essentially, if, if we want to build a system that allows us to track ownership without trusting third parties, we need to have this new type of ledger. Um, it's easy to create a public ledger, but the hard problem is preventing people from cheating and altering the ledger for their own benefit. So the solution is we, we flip the, the model upside down, and instead of having the ledger on one or two computers that are owned by governments or companies, we instead have everyone who wants to participate keep an, a copy of the entire uh, history of the ledger on their own computer. And this allows you to uh, check the, the cryptography of all of the transactions through history, which are actually uh, dependent upon each other. And so this is where we get the concept of a chain from, is that we take these batches of transactions and approximately every 10 minutes, we, we put them together, it's cryptographically verified, and it also points back to the previous batch of transactions. So this makes it really difficult for people to try to rewrite history. Um, if you try to go back in history, you actually have to recreate all of these blocks in order, which becomes exponentially more difficult from a computational standpoint. Okay, so let's talk about the blockchain in more practical terms that affect our daily lives. Um, how can blockchain allow processes for data-heavy industries like the medical field or even tech companies um, to become even more simplified for the consumer and for those companies themselves? A great property of blockchains is that you're essentially creating a tamper-proof history of, of historical changes. Um, blockchains aren't a silver bullet for computer security because you still have to secure these cryptographic keys that allow you to make the modifications to the blockchain. But um, you can do things uh, like what my company, BitGo, does is... Uh, we actually support something called multi-signature algorithms. And so what that allows you to do is uh, have trust that is then split up between a couple of different entities. It's another way of having sort of uh, checks and balances against uh, making changes to these ledgers. So we're seeing now uh, a number of banks, uh, the R3 consortium, for example. Uh, there's also the, the open source Hyperledger project. And they're getting into blockchains and distributed ledgers in general because they understand that there are a lot of applications where there are already these semi-trusted networks. And if they could automate all of the uh, validations that are currently be, being done like manually by humans, then you can, you can get a lot more efficiency. So one way of, of thinking of blockchains or distributed ledgers is that it's essentially a way to automate bureaucracy. So whenever we're, we're just we're checking each other's work in any type of system, because we're just creating new rules here, then we're doing it in such a way that you can automate it out and have a bunch of computers doing it rather than having, say, uh, accountants uh, tally up all the numbers every night. Right. And, you know, how can the blockchain then protect companies from hackers? I mean, first thing that comes to my mind is uh, the target hack that uh, compromised um, their customers' data and information. I mean, how would blockchain protect consumers from that? Like the difference between credit cards and, and cryptocurrency is that with a credit card transaction, you're actually handing over all of your private financial data to the merchant, and they're taking that, those keys, and pulling money you know, from your account. And the result of that is that you have to trust every merchant you interact with to have good security practices and not uh, leak out your, your private data. Otherwise, then, you know, you've got identity theft, you have to get new credit cards, all that. With, uh, with a blockchain, uh, you're instead... Uh, using the cryptography to push a transaction out onto the network that modifies the, the ledger 
and and sends the money somewhere. So it's more like a digital cash. So the the result being that the merchants that you're interacting with are just getting your money directly, and they don't have the the private data to to take any more from you. So even if a hacker gets into Target system, they won't be able to take any more Bitcoin from you. On on the other hand, from like a non currency perspective, uh, like I said, the blockchain essentially creates this immutable history of of everything that's ever happened within the system. And so if a hacker tries to go in and change entries from the past uh, to their benefit, then it's quite simple to have your computer automatically perform an audit that will show you exactly where the tampering occurred. Very interesting. So, uh, Jameson, we just have one minute left. Can you briefly explain the pushback that blockchain has received in comparison to, say, Bitcoin? I mean, when Bitcoin was uh, first made headlines, it received a lot of pushback from the financial industry and even government. Um, what kind of pushback has blockchain received? The industry, like the financial industry and a number of other industries, seem to be really interested in blockchain, but not Bitcoin. Now, uh, I've been to a number of meetups and talked to a number of people that are in this space, and their their primary concerns with Bitcoin-like systems are that that Bitcoin is uh, permissionless. So you know anyone who wants to can can join the system and 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 use it as long as they're following the rules. But what uh, banks and other financial networks want is they they want a a system that they can somewhat control more and you know only give uh, validation authority to trusted entities and they want to be able to have even better privacy and they want to be able to have you know even more uh, transaction volume and it's it's very hard for them to be able to to squeeze all of their use cases into Bitcoin because Bitcoin is trying to be this generic uh, trust ledger. Uh, so when they, they're looking at more specific use cases, they want to be more efficient and sort of replicate the, the systems that they exist, they already have. Well, thank you so much, Jameson Lopp, for joining me today and explaining that in plain English. Jameson Lopp, developer of blockchain for BitGo. Thank you. Thank you.